as a, Mr. Chairman, as an early advocate for legislative fixes to the troll problem, I'm glad we're having the opportunity to discuss this in detail today. Uh, and I, while I, I don't agree with all of the provisions of the bill, I applaud Chairman Gillette's attention to the issue and his willingness to, uh, to dive into this with solutions to a genuine and growing problem. And I appreciate, in particular, Chairman Goodlatte's willingness to work through disagreements. I'm hopeful that we can get to a place where we can all be supportive uh, of a final piece of legislation. Uh, for a problem this complex, there can't ever be one solution alone. Any work that we do to combat the predatory environment that has allowed patent trolls to prey on both large and small companies has to focus, I think, on stopping bad behavior and establishing incentives for responsible action rather than going after specific business models. Those business models will change if we don't address the underlying behavior. Uh, we also have to take a comprehensive enough approach so that we don't find ourselves back in the same situation a year down the line with little actually solved in spite of bills that we may have passed. I think this necessitates a kitchen sink approach. Chairman's bill certainly does this, bringing together several approaches aimed at making uh, the patent troll business less profitable. It gives us a lot to talk about today. And I'd just like to focus the remainder of my time on a component of the Chairman's bill I strongly support, which is bringing greater transparency to the patent system. Uh, Mr. Kapos, you spoke, you mentioned real party and interest as one of the items that would be a constructive addition to current law. You also acknowledged earlier in the hearing that the real party and interest language, uh, that some have advocated for stronger language still, um, I, I count myself as among those who do. And I, first, uh, though, I've been, I've been monitoring the PTO's current examination of what can be done to enhance real party and interest disclosure within their existing authority. Um, I'd welcome your comments on the, the work that they've done thus far and um, particularly where that might go as a former PTO director. Well, thank you, uh, Congressman. Uh, and indeed, um, where I was going with my comment before was that uh, the, the provisions of this bill mainly affect the real party interest disclosure in litigation. What about in all those other contexts in front of the expert agency where people really need to know who they're dealing with? So I applaud your focus on uh, the USPTO's efforts. I do not think the USPTO has enough statutory authority now. would love to see them get more to be able to require the necessary disclosures at all the touch points in the patent system where parties are coming in and asking the agency to do work for them. Um, I appreciate that. I think it's not just the, the touch points in the patent system. Um, as, as you know, the Goodlip Bill adds new requirements at the initial complaint stage. Um, and I certainly agree it would be helpful over the current system, and I agree with you that, uh, that identifying those, those specific points within the system are appropriate. Uh, but I worry that it leaves out earlier places in this chain where it would also be critically helpful uh, people who receive demand letters uh, without a key piece of information that they need in order to decide whether to settle, whether to litigate, uh, or frankly, sometimes whether to just shut their doors. What additional transparency requirements might be helpful for the system as a, as a whole as we, as we try to approach it that way? That's a good point. Uh, so you're talking demand letters. You're talking the, the portion of the system that lies between the USPTO's authority and the court's authority. And the, and, right, and a the great example of why I think more discussion is needed um, as we consider this bill on this particular point. Uh, Mr. Kramer, y you, your testimony also highlighted that the, uh, the value to practicing companies for enhanced transpar transparency. Uh, when I started on this committee a few years back, I assumed that patent ownership was fairly straightforward. It was easy to identify. Uh, I've learned, obviously, otherwise. Uh, the opposite is true. It can be difficult to know who the true party behind a demand letter is, uh, when a, or even when a defendant goes into court. And even properly identifying real parties in interest for a particular patent can be complicated based on exclusive licensing agreements that, that are also in place other private contracts that might exist. So I, I'd ask if you could just ex expand upon your experience managing uh, the IP portfolio in dealing with plaintiffs who intentionally hide the identities of owners or key investors, and then finally just stepping outside of the bill for a moment as the person responsible for a large patent portfolio, if you could address whether it, it would be overly burdensome for you to have to record ownership of your patents whenever you sell or acquire them. Thank you, Congressman. Let me take your second uh, question first. So, uh, I, uh, patents are a government grant, right? And I think the, the government, uh, yeah, as well as the public, should understand who has a financial interest in them. As a, as a holder of patents, I'm more than happy to record my transactions with the patent office. Right? Uh, 
so people know who, who owns those patents. Um, so that's your, that's your second question. Uh, in terms of, of um, uh, complicating the procedures, uh, certainly you know, my uh, experience has been in, in the real problem is in the settlement of litigations, right? When all of a sudden a party across the table says, well, you know, I gotta, I gotta talk with my investors to see whether I can accept that, right? And that's a problem, right? I, I personally wanna know who I'm dealing with in the context of a litigation. Uh, uh, I, you know, I don't want to keep feeding this vicious cycle of troll litigation. So uh, if I know that the same person is on the other side of the case for me, I might fight it harder. I might not settle because Otherwise, whatever money Yahoo ends up paying them, right, they're just going to go buy another patent and sue me again, right? And uh, I don't want that to happen. So I think it's very important that we know the parties who have an interest in the patent and an interest in the litigation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Collins from Georgia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Also, I appreciate the this uh, process, and this has been something that I have before I was even sworn in, began the process of looking at this because we knew it was going to be coming back up. There was too much uh, conversation going on. I appreciate, Mr. Armitage, what you said about the fog around patent litigation. I, I come to think of it not more as a fog, but, a, but a, when my staff comes in and we have these sort of dream sequences, I believe. I'm, I'm going to wake up and I'm in the shower or something. But it, it's like, what is this? Where are we headed here? And I think that's the concern I have in, in looking at, over this. And the question, uh, Mr. Capas, I want to ask this to you, and it's uh, long, I want to sort of lay it out. The question on, that I have is on whether or not Section 18 should have been, one, originally included in AIA, and whether its expansion in this bill is necessary or really even appropriate. Now, is that one that I have been given a lot of thought to, and honestly, it causes me some trouble. There is a question that the, there is no question that the right to patent, the right to exclude, is given inventors by the Constitution. Patent rights are property rights, but they are unique in the only in that the only way for an inventor to protect his property and to protect his patent is to assert it in court. If a subject matter is patentable, then I believe that it has the same value as another patentable subject matter. No monetary, of, not monetary of course, but it should enjoy the same protection, the same ability to license, the same ability to assert, and is other patentable subject matter. Many other minds have discussed at great length during the AIA 4 debates of Section 18 place expediency of process above protection of patent rights, and I'm not seeking to re hash or relive those debates. However, I am struggling with a provision that would make permanent a temporary program that does not expire for six years. What I have found in my short time here is Congress legislates, then they collect data, and supposed to conduct oversight. I am in mind of that in finding that that's what we're sort of doing again here. We're running to do something, then we're going to look at how it works or maybe look at it later. So is there anything that you can tell me that would basically assure my fears or is there some compelling argument for why we must make permanent today a provision that doesn't expire for six years? Wouldn't it be more prudent to let this provision act as it was intended, operate for eight years, conduct oversight, assess the program and its achievements, and then decide, if so, to whether to extend it or make it permanent? Well, thank you, Representative Collins. I would, um, if anything, amplify your fears so that bubble sequence could um, get rather darker. The challenge with this provision is it has just been implemented. It is just getting on its feet. And in fact, Congress has called for a study of the post-grant procedures, including Section 18, about this time two years from now, September of 2015. So I, I com completely ascribe to and agree with the process that you've articulated. Congress already called for that process as part of the AIA. We need to let it run forward. and. Yeah. Well, learn more. Well, and I appreciate it. And I, I want it to everyone in this room because there's a, there's holders in all these seats here um, looking at this. This is, a, this is not a good workable system, what we have now. There are problems all up and down the line. I think there's some things that we've got to do to, to address this. What really concerned me, though, is Mr. Kramer, is just a comment that you made that sort of took my whole question when you were asked directly, can you cite an example where an expanded process would have helped you? And you said you really couldn't name one. That concerned me, but I have a, do have a question for you as well. That, your statement just brought my, crystallized my whole question line. And you as Ms. Webb, Ms. Gupta as well. I understand that both of you have some concerns with the provision in the bill on the standard for the PTO to apply when examining a patent in the post-grant uh, procedures. Can you explain the, you know, as briefly as possible the, the nature of your uh, concern and the reasoning for your concerns on this standard for post-grant uh, procedures? Uh, certainly. Let me let me first address the uh, the example. 
uh, question. Uh, I, I understood that Chief uh, Congressman was asking me for uh, a prior case. I couldn't think of a prior case. I can think of a, a, a current case where we've used the system, and that's the MetaSearch case. So there is one. Well, her question was where is one that would ex expansion would have helped you, Correct. and I think that's sort of where we're headed here. So you really, and I appreciate that, but Correct. you crystallized my question. So. Uh, in terms of an example, um, uh, I'm sorry. The post-grant review. The post-grant review. Uh, that's a, <laughs> that's a, uh, I understand there are concerns on both, both uh, sides of the aisle with respect to the standard of uh, claim construction uh, being proposed. Uh, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, that's an issue where on the one hand, uh, you've got uh, 100 years of PTO history using one standard uh, and, and to change things that think might be dramatic uh, for them. Um, uh, certainly willing uh, and happy to work with you on, on finding resolution to that problem. Well, I think in some way, wouldn't you agree that this bill itself is, and Mr. Armitage, I think, are, is sort of alluded to this, this bill is changing procedural provisions in a specialized way for patents that, you know, really, if this goes through as is, books will be written because you're going to have to explain how you're going to go through the process now. It, it, it is a process that is currently a, a standard that we all have to face already. In but with new discovery requirement stays, those kind of issues like that, I mean, that's an issue that, you know, there's many things in this bill that, are, that I believe can be workable and are workable and I support. You know, I think the PTO office is actually, and that's one of the reasons I signed on, to make sure that we put the right resources where the resources need to go. Okay. Um, and I, that was a concern. Um, anything to add to post-grant? Um, you know, we happen to, um, our patents are from time to time subject to post-grant review uh, process, uh, procedures, and we put patents through post-grant re review procedures as well. And from our perspective, um, whatever, you know, wherever we end up on this um, and, and a thoughtful sort of outcome, we're willing to live by the same set of rules when they're applied to our patents and, and, and when we apply them to others' patents. But where we really have a lot of hope and our focus has been on is sort of, you know, anytime a system goes out of whack, you get feedback, and, and with the feedback, you can take some corrective action. There's clear feedback on the litigation abuses that we see, and this bill has so much good in the area of procedural abuse, um, you know, sort of feedback mechanisms. Um, you know, our focus has always been on supporting those aspects and making sure that those tweaks are indeed put in place. Well, and I know my time is running short, but I, I do appreciate the fact that you're willing to be, you know, everybody needs to play, but that's something that's sort of lost in this town, that some people want this treatment and other treatment, and we want to treat the same here as we move forward. Mr. Roberts, I've watched, just as my last moments here, is there anything to my questions or stuff that you'd like to add to that? Uh, ju just that we do have a 100 years history of the PTO in examination using one standard, but for the last 220 years, the PTO has never been given the authority by Congress to adjudicate the validity of issued patents. And so we're in a situation where the PTO is actually being the court, substituting its administrative patent judges for district court judges, and those claim construction standards in those two proceedings simply must be the same for the sake of fairness to the patent owner. Well, I think my time is, is going to raise some other issues concerning uh, stays on transfer of venues, some other things. We'll get to those, but I appreciate the chairman's time, and I appreciate this coming forward in our discussions today. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, and at this time, the gentlelady from Washington, Ms. Del Bonet, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to all of you for being here and for all of your time. Um, I kind of wanted to follow up, actually, Mr. Kapos, um, discussing Section 9's um, s changes to standard of claim construction in inter party and um, post-grant review proceedings. You pointed out that this may lead to the PTO endorsing and issuing broader claims in these proceedings. And so I wondered if you could speak more about the impact of this provision and whether you view the current use of broadest reasonable interpretation standard as effective in achieving the goals of our proceedings or whether you think there needs to be a change. Well, I, th I think that um, uh, con Congress, when it put the AIA in place, uh, did so knowing that the USPTO has for many, many years been using the so-called BRI, or Broadest Reasonable Interpretation. So I think that there's fairness on both sides of this debate. The reason BRI has always been the standard is that in the USPTO, unlike in the courts, uh, applicants or patentees have opportunities to amend their claims. And so the view is, look, the agencies uh, mandate is to protect the best interests of the public, ensure that overbroad claims are not being granted, and therefore take a reasonable but broad interpretation. Applicants can 
can amend their claims and the public's best interest is protected the challenge that we get into with moving the u s p t o to the skill of ordinary one of ordinary skill in the art standard that the courts use is that then quite clearly the agency will be issuing claims that are going to be broader in some cases less clearly defined in some cases and in that sense that provision while there are plenty of merits to it as mr armitage points out does cut against the core of this legislation which is to try and improve the quality of the patent system and reduce vague patents that lead to these overbroad assertions that folks to my right are concerned about thank you mr kramer do you have anything else to add as we were talking about post grant review okay thanks um we also know that um the impact on small business and and venture-backed businesses startup companies the impact that um abusive litigation is having um today robin feldman the professor of law at the university of california hastings and the national venture capital association released findings from a survey that they did of venture capitalists and startup companies and the results are very clear that the number of patent demands received by venture-backed companies has increased over the last five years um, roughly one in three startup companies report receiving patent demands. Um, so when we talk about this legislation, and I think, um, Mr. Kaplis, you brought up earlier that um, we may still need feedback from small inventors in terms of the impact of this legislation. I wondered y what your thoughts were with respect to the impact of this legislation on small inventors, um, small innovators, and what changes you might look at um, given what you might perceive their feedback to be. Right, well, thank you for that question. Uh, my, my sense, and I don't pret pretend to represent the small inventor community, but my sense is that uh, when they register their views, they will have some concerns. They'll have some concerns that go along the lines of access to justice uh, by being potentially priced out of the system, and we need to be sensitive to that. They'll have some concerns that when they go to enforce their valid patent rights, that large companies and medium-sized companies and even modest-sized companies that have far more resources, though, than the small entities and the independent inventors um, will be able to potentially engage in the same kind of actions that we're talking about here that we don't want patent trolls um, engaging in. So that's why I commented before that while I, I like lots about the bill, I think that um, reciprocal provisions are needed to ensure that parties in the role of defendants are acting responsibly, um, just as we're requiring parties in the role of plaintiffs to act responsibly. And Mr. Gupta, the, you know, um, you also talk in your written testimony about um, the impact on small business. So I wondered if you had anything to add with respect to how this bill might balance the needs of large, large businesses, but also small innovators. I think the um, again, I, I can't necessarily speak for all small businesses, but. I think if you think about um, VC-backed companies or small companies that are truly entrepreneurial, um, they have an idea, a business idea, they get a patent on it, and they're working towards bringing a product to market. Um, I think they are more concerned about the abusive litigation tactics that, that are directed towards them. The data that we have suggests that more than half of these patent suits are filed against companies that have revenues of less than $10 million and a vast majority against companies whose revenues are less than 100 million. And, and so, you know, and, and when um, small companies initiate uh, patent action against someone else, they generally do not uh, take advantage of pr procedural uh, tricks to, to increase the cost of litigation of the, on the other side, and they're certainly not looking for an early settlement to get out of it. They are at that point protecting their invention, their innovation, their business. They're not looking for a settlement where they end up licensing the patent so that this alleged infringer could then be competing against them using the technology that they want to commercialize. And, and in, tops, in, 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 in the uh, context of access to justice, I think you have to look at the fact that the defense costs in, in, in today's patent system is so great and so high for small businesses, I think effectively they're being excluded from this justice system because the only way they can feel they can participate is by having to give in to these extortions and settle rather than actually get to the merits of the dispute to prove their non-infringement position or their invalidity position. Thank you. I yield back my time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Pose, recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, one of the uh, strengths of our system is that it treats everybody the same. And uh, in fact, the United States has fought to establish a non-discrimination between types of inventions in international trade under the TRIPS agreement. Do you think that uh, other countries like Brazil, India, and China will use this as an invitation to harm one of our best industries like software? I'm I this is open to whoever wants to answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly take that on. I've been mentioning that all morning here. Um, well, I do think there's risk of that. And I think that uh, the, the provision you're referring to, Section 18, the covered business method provision, and inserting into it an overt um, quite blatant discrimination against software-based innovation will invite um, our trading partners to sit up and take notice uh, and to potentially have that come up in, um, in trade negotiations. And I think that's one of the many reasons why um, extension to the software field is uh, not good policy. So the answer is what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what <laughs> the, the, the answer, answer was. The um, answer is enthusiastically to agree with your concern. <laughs> and so what do we do about it? Do you have an answer on what we should do about it? Any of you? Well, I've never seen four lawyers quiet in my life like this. <laughs> uh, yeah, relative to Section 18, I do, which is that we certainly should not be expanding it to cover software. Right. And the better judgment, I think, overall, given that it's so new, given that it is getting traction, given that the USPTO has interpreted it broadly, given that its reviewing court hasn't had time to even look at the USPTO's interpretation, is that it's best to let that procedure keep running forward and not okay. amend it at this All point. Right. Mr. Armitage, did you want yeah, to make yes. a comment? Uh, Thank you. I, I would just say that in the course of the American Vents Act, Congress made a finding that there were a particular type of patent based on developments in the law and the work of the Patent Office in examining them that justified a transitional procedure to deal with those patents and, and specified the transition period. And as Mr. Capo says, the case hasn't been made to change any of those findings, uh, much less make it what was a transitional program a permanent part of our patent law. Congressman, uh, thank you for the question. I, I think that there should be low-cost alternatives uh, to uh, challenge within the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office uh, pat patents that do not have a technical solution to a technical problem. And th that is the definition that the USPTO has adopted. Therefore, I think it's a good program. Okay. Mr. Armitage, did you want to weigh in on that again? Yeah, just, just one comment. Every issued U.S. patent that meets the CBM definition tomorrow could be challenged in the Patent Office, and there'll be another six years when that can happen. And that could happen for every newly issued patent during the next six years. Under the new patent law, every first inventor to file patent that issues is subject to the identical type of procedure on any ground of patentability that covers all technologies. So we already have in place a comprehensive system of post-grant review. We don't need yet another procedure or to expand an existing procedure to take care of existing patents. Um, every time, not every time, but many times when Congress gets involved in anything, it makes it worse whatever it is. Of course, we don't want to do that. And now the, the proposal is, you know, H.R. 3309 would expand the covered business method program, even though it's only been in effect about a year. Um, is it too soon to make changes in the law that really hadn't been tested much? Two cases, I believe. Too soon? I would say uh, yes, on balance it is. Too soon. That's too. And my opinion is it's not too soon. Two and one? Um, I'd have to concur. That it's too soon or not too soon? Um, I think <laughs> as, as we have only one decision, um, it, we, we'd really like to see how the system plays Understood. out. All right. Three and one. All right, thank you. Um, small guys, I think the reason, one reason we got patent trolls to begin with is because the small guys are looking for help. That's one reason. Does I'm concerned about the small guy going against Yahoo or somebody else. Uh, they don't. They don't have lawyers. They, you know, they call their family lawyer or something if they need help. Uh, patent law, as we know, is a very specific, difficult litigation process. It's much more complicated than probably anything. Uh, so, uh, small guy, how do we make sure the small guy isn't excluded from the system? 
That's the end of the question because I'm out of time. How do we keep the small guy excluded from taking care of their patent? Mr. Chairman, I see the uh, time has expired. Can I respond to the question? Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Since, since <laughs> Yahoo was identified in the question, I feel like I have enough response. I'm not picking on Yahoo. I'm just giving an example. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, there is nothing in this Mr. bill that prevents anyone from filing a meritorious lawsuit, right? Matter of fact, yeah, there are provisions in this Come bill on, that will, would help the small guy. Staging discovery, giving presumptive limits no, on right. discovery, those things will, will definitely help the small individual inventor to pursue a meritorious claim against any company. Well, what they're concerned about is the loser pays provision. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. What they'd be concerned about, of course, is if they lose and then they got to pay. Well, they can't pay. Some of them say, I can't so pay, so I can't litigate. Under, under the, the provision as written, uh, it, it's very forgiving, right? It, that, although there is a presumption uh, that if you have, a, a, uh, there's a presumption towards uh, fee shifting, but if you have a substantially justified case, i.e. a good case, right, you're not going to pay. Or uh, there is also uh, a provision that provides the district court judge with discretion in special circumstances, if, it, if fee shifting is not warranted, then fee shifting will not happen. And it's, uh, it's a good thing to give the district court uh, judge that discretion. Former judge, I like the word discretion. I yield back. Thank you for your patience, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from New York, Mr. Jeffries, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me thank the witnesses for your testimony today. I found it to be both uh, helpful and illuminating. I represent a district largely anchored in Brooklyn uh, that increasingly has become home to technology and innovation companies, particularly a significant number of startups and tech entrepreneurs. That's been a very um, positive addition to the local economy and one that we embrace and want to foster and develop. Unfortunately, many of these same uh, entrepreneurs and startups have increasingly found themselves on the wrong side of the patent troll issue. Uh, and that's why, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think this is such an important hearing and, and an issue that we need to address thoroughly, comprehensively, uh, but also deliberately here in the Congress. Let me start with uh, Mr. Gupta. Uh, you testified, I believe, that you were sued uh, more than 30 times since 2005 by patent assertion entities. Is that correct? That is correct. And it's fair to say that in your view, each of these uh, actions were lacking in merit and frivolous, is that right? That is correct. A in fact, you know, of all these 30 cases, we have settled only one piece of litigation. We've taken uh, cases to trial. Cases have also been dismissed on summary judgment in our favor. So in the cases that you did not settle all but one, you prevailed in one way or the other in all of those other matters, is that right? Yes, or um, when the, we were able to convince the patent assertion entity that we were the last one standing and we were going to fight till the end and, and have our day in court, they have walked away. Now, were you awarded attorney's fees and did you apply pursuant to Section 285 in those cases that you ultimately prevailed in, either at the pleading stage or at some point during the lawsuit or uh, at trial? In a couple of instances, we were um, awarded our fees, um, I'm sorry, our costs in connection with having had to continue litigating after a certain point, but we have never been successful in recovering our attorney's fees and costs. Okay, now I think you also testified that patent assertion entities bring unmeritorious suits and then leverage the high cost of litigation to negotiate, I think, what you termed extortionary settlements. Is that correct? That is correct. I think that's, um, that's a colorful but fair framing of the issue uh, that folks confront. I think, Mr. Kramer, you, you characterized uh, the problem as defendants being forced to spend millions to litigate against abusive actions. Is that right? That is correct, yes, Congressman. Now, is it also fair to say that this litigation cost um, tends to primarily be anchored in the expensive nature of discovery in the patent context? Uh, that is a large component of the cost, yes. And so is it also fair to say that the ability to negotiate the extortionary settlements that these patent trolls seek, either with a demand letter or in the commencement of action, 
is largely anchored in the fact that the cost of discovery uh, is so expensive in many instances? Uh, I think it's anchored in the cost, in, in the fact that litigation as a whole is expensive and time consuming uh, and requires a lot of effort and attention from everybody involved. So is it reasonable to focus in terms of our effort to try and address the patent troll problem, uh, to try and limit the cost of the litigation either at the front end. This time, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Issa is, is on your funding bill. He's on the funding bill. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I mentioned that in my opening remarks, uh, Congressman Issa. This should, this should help as I, as I batter the witnesses with questions. Uh, first of all, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that a letter dated July 30th, 2013, which went to uh, the chairman both in the House and ranking members in the House and the Senate, be there, uh, be submitted into the record, Mr. Speaker. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kramer, your, uh, your company was on this, uh, this uh, letter, which is no surprise, uh, in support of uh, expanding uh, CBM to a certain extent. Uh, supporting the STOP Act, although not stating it. Uh, you obviously believe there needs to be a low-cost alternative to narrowing the claims or eliminating overly broad and poorly uh, executed patents. Is that correct? That is correct, Congressman. Yes. And by definition, if you've got bad patents, Mr. Armitage, I'll give you a chance to respond, but if you've got bad patents in one category and they're being adjudicated, if you will, through a low-cost system, and you have others that are being ignored, but they're being executed on in court, isn't that inherently a, a flaw in existing legislation not to have picked them up? I think it's a flaw in existing legislation uh, not to provide low-cost alternatives uh, where uh, you, know, you have these bad patents, whatever their technology, uh, and you don't provide the ability in a, in a broad way to go back to the patent office to address those things. And post-grant review and inter partes uh, review have limitations. In, in scope. And I certainly agree. Mr. Armitage, you, uh, you, said you talked about 100 years of a standard. You're familiar with, until maybe 20 years ago, or less than that, about 20 years ago, means plus function claims uh, allowed somebody a quick and dirty way to describe an invention and then make it extremely broad when under the doctrine of equivalence. Do you remember that? I'm sorry, I, I do remember before the Federal Circuit clarified how Section 112. They struck it down. They absolutely killed means plus function as a way to get broad patents while narrowly defining them, didn't they? Uh, I don't want to get into a debate, but I still urged clients when I practiced to use means plus function claims because they. As long as all they wanted was the means and, uh, th uh, that they were showing, correct? Well, I'm, I'm going to say you're substantially correct, and afterward we can discuss <laughs> the exceptions. <laughs> Well, the, uh, Mr. Campos, I lived under those, those old means plus functions as uh, an inventor and as a manufacturer. And, uh, you know, I saw people who took a couple of relays and popped them together and threw a patent with a line drawing out and then said, darn it, your microprocessor or your complex gate array with thousands of gates in it or, or huge amounts of memory, it's the equivalent and tried to claim that because the output of the device did the same thing, that it must have the same input. Do you, you also remember the, that era of overly broad interpretation that, quite frankly, paled in comparison to what's happening today with business method patents, isn't it? I, I certainly do, um, a Representative Issa. Rep and not that you're that old, but, but you know, I am. <laughs> over over breadth uh, associated with 112.6. What definitely was a problem, it has been significantly reined in. Well, it, it has, but there's a new generation, a new generation of workarounds, just as the eBay decision is being worked around by going to the ITC whenever possible to get an exclusion because the court, when they said they set a standard for injunctive relief, they didn't consider that there's an entity just down the street that only does effectively injunctive relief. It's the only tool, and they use it constantly because they have to. So, you know, legislatively, certainly, we have a similar challenge that the court only can consider what's brought to it, where we can consider all the problems that are brought to us. I, uh, Mr. Campos, you have a tough job. But under the current law, if you do not have a standard to look at prior art as broadly 
as prior art is expressed when it comes before the patent office don't you inherently find yourself in a situation in which examiners are constantly being told that prior art is narrow well in fact if that same prior art were coming before a court it would like the old means plus function suddenly be expansive isn't there a need for a standard change that makes it clear that you must consider prior art as broadly as possible from a standpoint of exclusion and that's not currently the case the examiners are often faced with uh, claims that something means very little and with relatively re little recourse to argue that point. Well, are, are you asking whether the court should have to move to the broadest reasonable interpretation standard? No, actually, my point is the broadest reasonable interpretation standard should apply to what has already been invented. And one of the challenges is it's applied to your consideration of what a, 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 an applicant is entitled to rather than the exclusion. The, the, the whole point is that the, the and, and you mentioned earlier, the obviousness standard, we have a problem which is w if anyone of ordinary education, not necessarily ordinary skill in the art, but if ordinary education reads the existing patents and then looks at a new patent, most often they search endlessly to try to figure out what's new. And they find a little nuance you know, I had a relay and I had a car and now I've got a relay, a car and a mobile radio. And they say, aha, it's the mobile radio. Or is it? The fact is we have a fundamental problem that regularly your examiners have a standard which under the scrutiny of an opposition from an outside party bringing in the actual and real experiences, the actual products and what they do are successful in narrowing patents dramatically on a regular basis. Isn't that true? I see. So you're asking about the inferences that examiners are able to draw. Uh, certainly, in, in my view as a citizen, that has improved um, since KSR and some of the cases that have interpreted it. Further refinement clearly is needed. I would agree with you, Congressman Issa, that, that um, providing the USPTO with greater flexibility to apply inferences um, and to expect applicants to respond to those to in order to clearly specify patent claims is good for the whole system. Now, when I was learning about patent law as a, both an inventor and as a manufacturer, uh, you know, I understood that you could be sued for your making, using, or selling a product. But I don't think I ever considered that on the, of these 40 companies, that the ones most concerned with people with great new technology would be suing, being sued. I didn't think of Eddie Bauer, Safeway, J. Crew, Overstock.com, the Kroger Company, Macy's. Now, I've been in a lot of Macy's. I've been in Kroger. I've been in Safeway. Isn't one of the problems that this committee has to deal with is the growth of deep pocket large companies, and I, Mr. Poe talked about little companies, and I was a little company, and I appreciate the cost of litigation, but isn't one of our problems the idea that incidental use has made companies large targets just because they're using a product? I've got Wi-Fi in my store, and I'm going to be sued as a result as often, and isn't one of the most important things that we have to do in the legislation we're looking at today to make sure that the manufacturer, the ultimately the entity, the single entity that probably is in the food chain is the, is the entity that deals with the eventual use of their product rather than being sued in jurisdictions all over the uh, country simply because I put 100 Wi-Fi uh, units into my store to help my customers or you know, my, my airplane serves a certain type of food that somebody finds a way to have a patent on. Uh, Mr. Campos, I'll start with you, and then I'd like to go to Mr. Kramer. Yeah, so that's the uh, stays for customers, and uh, as we've discussed, I, I certainly am in, in the group that would agree that uh, retailers, right, the Krogers of the world. Particularly when they're not selling the infringing product, but simply using something that somebody has put through. If they're using it to run their Wi-Fi's or if they're selling it um, uh, end users, in, you know, this would be Kroger in the, in the role of an end user or Kroger in the role of a retailer should be able to stay out of litigation. The trick is 
letting them do that in a way that doesn't also <coughs> let every other party in the manufacturing value chain stay out of litigation. Because if you do that, then you significantly devalue patents for companies in, you know, whether it's in auto alarms or any other industry where you've got you know, lots of parties adding value to components, making more and more aggregated products. You don't want to devalue the whole patent system. You do want to protect the end users and the retailers. Well, and, and, and I know the chairman's being understanding uh, about my time, but you know, the intermittent wiper case was, was certainly a great case under Averill Cohen in which it added value to the car and some understanding of entire market was the case. I'm pretty sure that the, the delivery of groceries at a Kroger's or a Safeway is not so dependent on Wi-Fi. And, I, and I, th I certainly think that there's a fair test of entire market, but that's not the test that currently these trolls are using when they choose to go after deep pockets. Mr. Kramer, I, I'm, uh, although the chairman may allow others to answer, I, I'd like to just have, you know, you've been used as a big company, but ultimately, aren't you just a big target, and isn't that part of what you see every day? Yeah, thank you for that question. That is, uh, that is absolutely true. Since 2007, we have received uh, roughly 70 uh, patent infringement complaints. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a huge increase in our litigation burden, particularly when compared to the first 12 years of the company where we had, uh, at any given time, two to three cases on our docket. Now, in a, you know, case we, we settle cases, we get new cases uh, on our docket at any given time, it's 20 to 25 cases. So we are a huge target. Uh, and then, and I, I think that has to do with uh, the nature of the, our technology, uh, the fact that, that uh, you, know, you can see pretty easily what we do, uh, and uh, the fact that uh, software patents are, uh, quite frankly, uh, there are a lot of them out there on a lot of different things. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, I, I can't emphasize how not enough how, uh, how our situation has changed over the years. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, th I appreciate your indulgence, and, and I thank you for all the hard work that the committee is doing to try to uh, improve patent qualities and particularly in, empower the PTO to do so. Thank, thank you, Mr. Issa. Uh, I wasn't really concerned. You did spend 12 minutes, but you... At you, the know, start, I, you know, the darndest you, thing, you I almost, don't have I've never clock. heard you badger a witness, but you, you came close on Mr. Armitage. Uh, well, you, you know, Mr. Chairman, you know, if you come next door, uh, we're, we're, we're accused of doing that to a number of people. Oh, no, I've never, never noticed. No, no. It, you know, Eric Holder, Eric Holder said he was, he was a pleasure being here the last time. Yeah. But, Mr. Chairman, I, I do think that this is so important. I appreciate the extra indulgence of time. Thank, thank you. Um, that will conclude our hearing. I will make two comments. Uh, if you look at Section 9 of the legislation, that seems to be where a lot of the concern is for the post-grant reviews and uh, the, uh, the business method patent review. And uh, if each of you could go down, because you, I know the Internet Association I, that Yahoo's a part of is on one side of this and some other companies are on the other. Um, if you could take each of those uh, subsections, uh, like whether we, uh, whether section 145 is still necessary, uh, the estoppel fix, all those different parts, and just uh, uh, go through each one and tell us what your thoughts on those are, would be, uh, um, one of them is codifying, I mean, is taking the, uh, the board's decision in uh, uh, the business, I think it's uh, South versus uh, Versetta. Should that be, should we codify that, for instance, or just leave it alone? Yeah, I, I, I don't think we should. I okay. think that the Federal Circuit and the USPTO should have some time to further consider and refine that. Okay, thank you. Uh, that, uh, that concludes today's hearing. Uh, thanks to all of our witnesses for attending. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kramer, that was uh, 